Well, we're back on Careers in Discovery with Shane Hegarty of Axonis Therapeutics. Shane, welcome to the show. Absolutely. Pleasure to, to be here, uh, albeit virtually, but great to uh, be on the podcast. I've actually listened to uh, a number of episodes, very, very, uh, you know, informative and good Good to hear other people's stories and see where the parallels are. And yeah. uh, you know, I think it's a great platform and um, I, I was honoured to be invited on today to tell you the story of Exonus and myself. Ah, oh, thank, thank you. And we're delighted to have you. Um, and we always like to start a little bit with what you're doing now, uh, as, oh, yeah. as you may know from previous episodes. So I'm really interested to find out more about KCC2, about Axonis and about the work that you're doing there. Definitely. Well, uh, Exonus Therapeutics is a company that we spun out of Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. It's operational since about 2019. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the chief scientific officer and co-founder of the company. And we're developing first in class and best in class oral medicines targeting KCC2 for a range of different uh, neurological disorders, primarily focused on epilepsy, pain, and spinal cord injury in right. the near term. But we're very excited about the therapeutic potential for KCC2. Um, and we're making the first drug to, to, um, to target this um, in the clinic. Hopefully, at the end of the year, we can start clinical trials. So, it's all. Um, it's a great uh, stage to be catching up with yourself and telling you what we've done to date and to put us in a position yes. to be ready to do clinical trials. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate some of this might be proprietary, so please don't worry if you can't say. But sure. why KCC2? And tell us a bit about the concept. So um, we almost stumbled across, across KCC2 as a target without much of a um, hypothesis-driven um, literature-based um, approach. We, mm -hmm. um, well, I was lucky enough to be a research fellow in Boston Children's Har uh, and Harvard. And at that um, institution, our professor, Xi Gang He, who's a, a world leading neuroscientist, has a background in, in genetics. And he was in favor of doing, number one, in vivo research, got her mm -hmm. in vitro research, which was a, a new um, experience for me at that, at that level. And also uh, of, in favor of doing unbiased phenotypic. Uh, forward genetic screens where he would ask a biological question and let the data drive the what's the most uh, you know important discovery um, and what I really was uh, enamored with the approach was that we would compare a lot of things side by side at once so you'd have right. your standard approaches included in these screens and you'd look at whether any new innovations were uh, demonstrating superior efficacy or phenotypes or some sort of uh, superior um, um, property. And mm -hmm. in that process is how the lab discovered KC2. So when right. I joined um, Jigang's lab, this, this screening project had already started. And um, they set up the screen to ask a question about spinal cord injury, mm -hmm. where patients have incomplete injuries. So if you look at a functional MRI, you'll see spare tissue bridges. But this tissue is functionally dormant, so they have complete paralysis despite the spare tissue. And what had been um, reported in clinical case studies is that you could reactivate it with stimulation devices, epidural stimulation devices. Mm -hmm. Quite complicated to fine tune the location of the electrodes and the settings to get it to work, but sometimes with great benefit. And Ji Gang was uh, very excited about this breakthrough, uh, but wanted to understand what was the biological basis of this um, yeah. functional restoration. And it was a neuromodulatory device that was achieving this. So he screened many different neuromodulatory compounds mm -hmm. for the ability to reactivate the dormant but spare tissue left in an injured spinal cord. And so he took many different, we'll call them tool compounds, some of them are on the market, targeting different ion channels, transporters, anything neuromodulatory in nature things that when you deliver to the mice peripherally, they would get into the CNS. And that was the okay. selection for about a dozen different compounds. So quite a labor intensive screen. Mm. We're talking, you know, you need uh, many animals to model this, this, um, this, you know, disorder, but it was worth it because what we found was that only the KC2 uh, tool compound was able to reactivate the spare tissue. Okay. And um, basically the mice could walk again. So it was quite a severe model where there was complete paralysis, no spontaneous recovery, and only the KC2 tool compound could 
restore our stepping ability quite consistently and chronically yes. in these in this model. And there was a lot of follow-up studies with genetic approaches and figuring out what cells and demonstrating that was indeed KC2 mediating this benefit. And that was the breakthrough discovery that led us to want to translate this preclinical research into a new therapeutic approach initially yeah. for spinal cord yeah. injury. Yeah, fantastic. And it sounds like this idea of sort of uh, reviving the neural tissue has wider implications, of course. You said you're looking at epilepsy now and at pain and uh, potentially other That's indications right. in the future. So where KC2 fits in is it's the chief uh, CNS-specific fluoride uh, transporter mm -hmm. and it has a vital role throughout life to continue to uh, transport chloride out of neurons. And that sets what's known as the chloride gradient. And um, at that point, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out where, where is that important? But it actually is the mediator of inhibition in the nervous system. Okay. So a lot of people are very familiar with GABA and it being an inhibitory neurotransmitter. But GABA A receptors are just ion channels. They open up mm -hmm. and they allow chloride to flow based on the gradient. If chloride flows into a cell, you get hyperpolarization and inhibition. If fluoride flows out of the cell, you get the opposite, depolarization and even excitation. And early in, in um, you know, even in human development, first two years of life, GABA is actually excitatory. And as KC2 expression increases uh, with, with brain maturation, you get a switch from GABA from being excitatory to inhibitory. That's right. the first critical role that KC2 has during development. But during adulthood, it needs to continue to function to maintain the chloride gradient that, it, um, respond, that neurons will respond to GABA and be inhibited. And there's a whole host of uh, neuropathologies that impact KC2 function mm -hmm. at synapses so that GABA no longer is inhibitory. And it leads to disinhibition of different brain circuits, depending on which are affected. And that can lead to a lot of um, pathological problems. Yes. And uh, that's what we're now um, aiming to address with our first in class medications targeting KC2. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and so you were you were working on this at the Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard, and um, obviously a lot of excitement about it in the lab. I'm always interested, at what point did you and the rest of the team think, do you know what, actually there's something here, we should we should go and do something with this, we should spin this out and and take this on the next step? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, when you're in a lab like this, we're leading lab, nature and cell papers quite yeah. regularly. And you have all these these different uh, discoveries still in the lab. You know, someone's following up with a previous breakthrough, looking at new applications, combining different things. There was a lot of exciting research in the lab. Axon regeneration, uh, Gigan was the first to demonstrate a cell autonomous mechanism that could help CNS neurons to regenerate. And that, a lot of interesting neuroprotective research um, interesting things around remyelination and uh, inflammatory um, problems. But this was the, the approach that had the greatest functional recovery we had ever seen. So mm. it was beyond kind of dramatic, even uh, anatomical yes. phenotypes that were, you know, still used today as a positive control in different fields. It, there was a clear functional improvement. And um, that was kind of what set it apart from anything else that had been discovered, just to, to, you know, just look at these videos of these mice walking again, and yeah. then look at all the other things that had tried and had not worked. And that was, we clearly were onto something very exciting. Um, and, you know, in the process of spinning it out, the, the company had existed because many different people were excited about Gigang He's research. And he had mm -hmm. a lot of different discoveries. I just mentioned axon regeneration being one of them. Um, but uh, Joanna, the CEO, and our other co-founder, Corey Goodman, who's, you know, number one, a very esteemed neuroscientist. He won the highest prize you can win in the field called the Google Neuroscience Prize right. for uh, characterizing different guidance cues for axons. But in the last 20, 30 years, he's built a number of biotech companies okay. with successful with multiple drugs on the market, and now he's managing partner, Ben Bio. So we, we managed to benefit from his neuroscience uh, knowledge and his, you know, being a you know world leading biotech, um, yes, you know, veteran, um, and so he was excited very from the beginning by Zhi Gang's research, and it was actually Zhi Gang and Joanna when they were thinking about um, the different 
um, programs. And we had multiple at the start, right? We, we were interested in the axon regeneration. We were interested in neural protection, all coming from different in vivo phenotypic screens we had done. One that, that I led with Joanna, which was we tested thousands of genes one by one in vivo using AV and CRISPR technology and found some mm -hmm. very exciting therapeutic targets that way as well. But when we really thought about it in terms of what's ready for translation, it was this kc 2 neuromodulatory approach. Kind of because of what I just said, everyone knows that gabaergic inhibition is a validated therapeutic approach. People are using benzodiazepines and there's other GABA PAMs, uh, GABA receptor yeah. PAMs. And um, so that's, that's a validated therapeutic approach. But the problem is some patients don't respond or they can only take the drugs for a short while because of tolerability issues or, or right. other, other limitations. Um, and what we were excited about was fine tuning this inhibitory mechanism for prolonged benefit. But also a key differentiator would be because we're not globally depressing brain activity um, by acting on an ion channel, just hyperpolarizing all the neurons at once, we are actually fine-tuning inhibition to restore physiological GABAergic mediated inhibition. Mm. That's the big that's the big difference. So we're leveraging the historic translation success of GABA mediated inhibition, but we're doing it in a more precise fine-tuning way right. that should um, should confer much more tolerability, but also address drug resistance that we see in uh, epilepsy and in pain, particularly mm -hmm. where even though there's been especially in epilepsy, maybe 20 different uh, anti-seizure medications approved, all um, helping patients to this day. The number of drug-resistant patients remain, and right. it's because they, they're acting on similar mechanisms. Um, so this novel mechanism may address that, and we've got data to make us excited about that possibility. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, um, this is, these are the types of clues that this is, a, this is science ready for translation into the clinic. Um, yes. Because, as I said, it, there was a lot of um, clinical validation. And the other fact was that there were patients um, who had KC2 mutations that mm -hmm. had epilepsy. So they had the early onset epilepsy, autism spectrum disorder, a lot of other behavioral problems. Um, and there was also larger GWAS studies associating KC2 mutations with a number of different psychiatric conditions. So it was a genetically validated target. Yes. Um, and the final point was KC2 is selectively expressed in the central nervous system. So that made it a very attractive target for small molecules. Yeah. We didn't need to worry about KC2 and other organ systems. How would we, maybe there'd be some on target issues in other organs that would limit the ability to the drug KC2 in the CNS. We didn't have to worry about that. Um, so that was all that together made us yeah. um, very confident that this was the most mature uh, science ready for translation, just as long as we could make the first in class drug. And that's the key thing, right? You got to you got to get yeah. there first as well. But there's lots of signs there saying you should go ahead and do this. Exactly, we're benefiting from maybe a decade or two of world leading science from many different labs. You know, the first report of KC2 being important was about 20 years ago, um, by the chair of our scientific advisory board, Eve Deconic. And they had discovered that in neuropathic pain, in the dorsal horn, in the spinal cord, there's a mechanism that should be suppressing painful signals, a sensory gate, and that's failing. And that it's failing because of KC2 hyperfunction. The inhibitory neurons there should be suppressing these signals, so they're not painful. And without KC2, the inhibitory neurons aren't able to do that. And you get right. facilitation of pain in a process known as CNS sensitization. And so that was his breakthrough, and he's been working on it for two decades, a lot of initially in pain, but now in many other indications. So we benefited yes. from these, these, a lot of different labs getting very excited about the target. And, you know, because it's got such a critical homeostatic role in the, in the nervous system throughout the lifespan, whenever someone really decides they want to study it in their model system and in their indication, they tend to find an important role for KC2, and that, you know, opens up. The therapeutic potential for us but then it makes it more difficult in terms of indication prioritization you know there's right. a lot of a lot of uh, different ways you could go and test the molecule and we get we have a lot of uh, exciting discussions and even inbound requests around where we could 
uh, start to look at the effects of these drugs. But, um, you know, we obviously spend a lot of time thinking about that and that informs our research and our R&D efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's just as important it's deciding important what not to do. Not to do. That's it? right. What to do. Um, yeah. And I want to come back to kind of the formation of the business, the growth of the business. And you've mentioned some of the amazing people who are involved uh, yes. in the project. Um, but I want to talk about you a little bit first, Shane. Uh, if that that's all right. <laughs> um, and we always like to go right back to the beginning. Um, yes. And um, I'm very interested in the origins of people's careers. And so, you know, take us all the way back to you being there in Cork. Uh, why science? Why neuroscience? Why why this path for you in the first place? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And there wasn't a, a very much, there wasn't a strategy to it sure. at all. Um, and what, what I did know is that um, I didn't want to work on the in the local chipper or the chip mm -hmm. shop. Uh, anymore, which I started doing at the age of 15. Um, and I, what I realized was from that experience and from experience of my wider family that not having a specialized skill set was, go was going to make it difficult in terms of doing something that I loved. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I was I was good at school and that helped me uh, have options going into university. But even then, I couldn't decide what I liked the most. I was thinking pharmacy, I had accounting up there. I was thinking about science and it was difficult to really pick um, what I wanted to do. So I picked a quite a broad science course and again, doing quite well. But it took me till about my second year, you know, still getting different scholarships and things like that. But for when it really clicked that now I've got this passion area and it doesn't mm. even feel like I'm, um, you know, studying anymore. I just want to read this and, and you know, dig into it deeper out of pure curiosity. Um, and it, it, I read this book when I was traveling. Um, by Jill Bolt Taylor called My Stroke of, My Stroke of Insight. And it was this uh, neuroscientist who had a stroke. And okay. in, the, in the book, she you know, first had to explain what the brain does and then spoke about her experience of having a stroke and how she understood what was going on and how she recovered from that kind of background expertise in neuroscience. So I became fascinated over that summer about the mm. function, dysfunction, plasticity, and potential of the human brain. And luckily, in third year at UCC, you could study neuroscience as a subject, but not much exposure to it before that. Um, yeah. But after reading that book, I knew that this was the area that I was fascinated by. I just couldn't know enough about uh, neuroscience, the human brain, even psychology, which my mother had uh, begun to study as well and had okay. a lot of interesting books around the house. So I, I knew that this was where, you know, I could study something and feel like it was a pleasure. And which is kind of a weird thing to say because it took me a while to get to that point. Yeah. But what that meant was I could spend a lot of time um, researching and reading about this uh, area. And it was then helping me be, you know, maybe at the end of the undergraduate top of my class that gave me a lot of options to uh, first be in a position to get, you know, stipends and different uh, PhD opportunities. But, but at the same time, I have the opportunity to go to the lab in UCC with Aideen and Jeremiah that ended up being my uh, professors overseeing my PhD and do a project that I was very interested in and that went well and we could propose a independent PhD project that was building on some of that uh, undergraduate work and that was funded as well. So right. it, 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 all, it all came from this kind of, um, I got getting really passionate about an area and just digging into it yeah. and just enjoying the process of doing it without really knowing where is this leading to? You know, I didn't have, there was no one that had done postgraduate, you know, education in, in either side of my family before that. There was no, you know, major career guidance going on. It was just Shane loves neuroscience and he could spend all day, you know, reading about it, researching it, and it seems to be working out well for him. He's, he's getting to do this PhD. It, it was that mm -hmm. type of process. Um, but, you know, it was very rewarding when, as I dug into it, and I had these fantastic teachers and mentors who, were patient with me, were patient with my curiosity, all the questions, you know, I wanted to know things that we didn't know yet about the human brain and its pathologies, and they were encouraging me to dig deeper and yeah. not dismissive in any way. And, you know, that helped me to just go and kind of test out these ideas or hypotheses that I had or, you know, already starting to write maybe a review article about a whole area, even though I know maybe credibility in your science as a young PhD student. Because I just wanted to know the state of the art for myself. I was also yes. kind of coming from a position of imposter syndrome. 
I'm in this new area. I don't know everything. Why would anyone listen to me? I'm going to have to read the whole fields, research papers, write my own review. And then I'm doing that as an exercise for my yeah. own understanding. And then it kind of put me in a position to have a knowledge base that I could build on, kind of take the next step in terms of innovation or research. And that kind of, that was my process academically for, for yeah, years. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I suppose as you develop as a scientist, you're almost deliberately putting yourself in positions of ignorance, right? Because you have to go and explore things that nobody knows anything about. Exactly. Um, there's context and there's surrounding information, but going to those places where there is no knowledge is kind of the point, right? Exactly. And if you have people around you who kind of trust and empower you to do it, yeah. rather than yeah. kind of are too prescriptive or too using you as like a pair of hands or something, just go, you do test my idea. I never had that and when I was coming up. It was very self-directed. I was getting these these scholarships and fellowships on my own proposals that I co-developed with my PIs. But I felt okay. like I was driving the research direction myself in areas that I was really excited about. So I could spend a lot of time on it. Rather yes. than maybe if I was assigned or just go and do this project on something, maybe I wouldn't have had the same level of commitment and, and excitement about it. And, mm. you know, enthusiasm isn't, you know, enough to sustain a whole PhD. You know, you have to be, yeah. you know, um, that's a great starting point. You have to actually somewhat enjoy the process of failing and figuring out why things aren't yeah. working and fine tuning things to get to a point where you've got a new level of understanding or something is working and now you've got a, a way of, of pushing kind of uh, the, the, you know, the research forward. Yes. And that, that was very productive for me for many years. And, the, the, you know, so that kind of led me through, you know, PhD postdocs were these passion projects. And I had opportunities to go elsewhere, different um, postdocs or PhDs elsewhere. But it was just the fact that I was, it was this, I felt like it was my own research kind of mm. direction. I didn't want to kind of give up on it. I just, I, I needed to get to the end of it kind of thing. I needed to, you know, we started out at the level of the ligands, figured out the receptors, figured out intercellular proteins were by the end were in microRNA. It was just like total characterization of this this area that I was really deeply interested in. And um, you know, that 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 was very productive for 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 many years. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to take on a lot of teaching right. opportunity like uh, responsibilities and I could do some some courses. So as I was specializing down in this one area, I was getting at the same time an ability to broaden my or even revisit things that I should have known from my undergraduate that you might forget as you just <laughs> so into something so niche in your new yes. research focus. So I was broadening my knowledge or revisiting things. And that was helping me thinking about um, problems from many different perspectives. And then the, 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 what I felt like the key competence from that whole time was if I can you know, explain it simply to undergraduate students or whoever it is, then, you know, then I don't understand it enough or they're not going to be excited about it. And that's become so important now in my career as an entrepreneur, mm. innovator, scientist, where I have to continually do that in a way yes. that creates a sense of urgency or excitement about what we're doing, why it's meaningful, why it's ready, why this is the time to to um, you know push this forward. And um, that that's kind of really important. And also, as I mentioned, in in Ireland, you know, there wasn't a lot of funding around. Right. So you're kind of having to apply for funding almost every year to even have a job kind of at that basic level of survival, but also to keep your research going. Like you're excited about this. You, you know that you want to do all these extra steps to really mm -hmm. understand it more deeply. And so you're working on these defined timelines, which ends up being like how you operate in the biotech, yeah. short kind yeah. of uh, milestone driven projects. But also while that's happening, already thinking about how you're going to fund the next step, how you're already you know preparing for that and um, being comfortable with the uncertainty of, mm -hmm. you know, you need to deliver on what you're doing right now, but already be um, preparing for the next the next step and yeah. uh, communicating to everybody why this is important and why this is valuable, and uh, being you know that that was that was you know unbeknownst to myself at the time uh, as an academic just wanting to be a professor, all those skills, all that experience, has really set me in a, a good kind of base for you know, what I'm doing today, which is a biotech a yes. co-founder and entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that communication of science is really key, isn't it? I think absolutely, as you as you say, in a fundraising context, but also from a teaching point of view, I always say to people now, I, 
I'm not a scientist. Um, I find science fascinating now because I'm speaking to people like you who are doing these incredible things. The way it was communicated to me in school was very different. And I think you know, there's, there's a key thing there, isn't there, that you touched on there, that you've got to make, you've got to go to the right level to make it interesting to the people you're communicating with, to, to yeah. stoke that passion. Then. Exactly. You need to understand what would engage the audience. What do they care about? What are you doing? Where's the bridge there? You know, the, the concept of entry points or whatever you want to call it, there's all sorts of terminology or pedagogical jargon you could use to talk about it, but really is about engaging with someone, trying to make them excited about what you're doing, wanting to, why do they, why would you, why would they want to spend time learning more about what you're doing? Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta kind of always be ready to, to do that and, and to multiple different stakeholders and, uh, you know, it's it's I find that really enjoyable and you know I don't know if it's true practice or you know natural ability that I find myself you know quite good at that um usually typing you know with the Irish accent maybe people can't even understand what I'm saying depending on what country <laughs> I'm in but that's been a you know a process of, of, uh, of adaptation even moving to the U.S. trying to uh, have people understand or slow down the way, way I talk so it's all been <laughs> fantastic experiences for me to continue to learn and grow in a way that hopefully will sustain a career in making new medicines for neurologic yes. disorders. Yes. It's all, you know, none of this was pre-planned. I wasn't even aware of biotech as a, as a thing, to be honest, right. before I became yeah. to Boston, I obviously knew about industry. Um, it, you know, there was, there was maybe a old school thinking that I would be giving up on my own lab and things like that if I was thinking about that. And even when I was in Ireland, before I came to Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, I was working on the faculty at my alma mater, but I had a chance to start my own lab um, in a tenure track position in another Irish university, right. which was exciting. Okay. But I was in this scenario of continued specialization, kind of narrowing, narrowing down, almost in a way I felt like I was pigeonholing myself that it's almost like I could never do anything else. So I wouldn't have the credibility to do something slightly different. And not that I wasn't that excited about what I was doing, but at the time, a couple of clinical trials were failing in this area, the neurotrophic factors for Parkinson's disease. And I couldn't ignore that. I did a systematic mm -hmm. meta-analysis for myself to figure out maybe if there was multiple trial data together, we would see something. And that wasn't, that didn't, you know, remain true. So I felt like, you know, do I really want to spend the rest of my career on this area? Yeah. And luckily, um, I had the opportunity at the same time to, to you know, go to Gian's lab, and when I went to his lab and discussed the types of projects he was doing and what we were going to plan for, for when I was there, you know, I couldn't turn that down. It was an opportunity right. that was too good to, to not do. You know, this highly resourced environment, cutting edge research, you know, the recent, you know that, that was a big difference to yeah. some of the stipends I had in Ireland were, you know, $5,000 for a year by a couple of suppliers. Here was think big, you know, there, there was no financial limitations to what we could yeah, do. Yeah. And it was just um, anything, the more ambitious, the better, um, which was great. And that was, you know, good, good for thinking big, but it's still, you still have to be focused. Yes. So it was like, yes. even when you have all these options, we've talked about KC2 having broad therapeutic relevance earlier. When you have all the options, you still have to focus. You still have to deliver on something of value in a, you know, with some clear, you know, milestones and deliverables in, in mind. So that, that was, you know, all, all this is, um, you know, there, when I'm, you don't really know what you're going to get out of as a learning experience before you get in. For me, it's normally I'm here to do a research project. I'm interested, mm -hmm. and all these other skills are just benefiting along the way. Now, yeah. retrospectively, yeah. I can see why these different experiences that have uh, put me in a position to be able to build the company we have today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so, did it feel absolutely. like, with the with the greatest of respect to UCC, did it feel like a step up? when you went out to Boston? Um, well, that's an interesting question because when I got there, you know, imposter syndrome was, which was through the roof, right. you know, uh, a lot of my friends were, were joking about goodwill hunting and things like that, uh, <laughs> you know, from Ireland. Um, so there, there was a, there was a trepidation about Shane will be found out that he's not, um, you know, a great neuroscientist. Cause at that point I, I felt very confident in my abilities. I'd been around Europe training as well. I went to, yeah. Uh, you know, KU Leuven and the Erasmus MC, and I've been meeting a lot of different individual conferences. I felt like, yeah, 
one of the you know up and coming, hopefully world leading neuroscientists. And uh, I even got a prize in Ireland called the Neuroscience Ireland Investigator Award that kind of validated what I had achieved to date and even at a quite a young age. So I was quite confident, but then, you know, I was still worried. And, but when I got there, even in our own lab meetings or any departmental meeting, what I realized was because we didn't have a lot of money to do, you know, huge experiments or, you know, a lot of different things at once, almost distracting amount of things at once, we had to spend a lot of time reading papers, you know, right. a, lot, a lot of times being very, you know, hypothesis driven. We could really only test one thing to test one thing, you need to be selective. You need to yes. think very deeply about your plan. You can't waste anything. And um, not to say that there's there's waste going on, but you know the the idea of just kind of testing everything. You know everything mm. is open. Yeah, you know, not that it's a bad approach. It's very broad and it can catch a lot of different um, you know un unknowns when you when you go about it that way. But um, I felt like at a theoretical level. I might have been at even a, a better position. Yeah, okay. No offense yeah. to my colleagues there, but that's what I felt when I was there. And it, you know, came back to another thing where asking the right question: what's the most important unknown? In terms of, at the end of this question, you'll have something that's going to help be of value to anybody. For me, it's always: is this going to be helpful in a patient? Is there some sort of therapeutic benefit for doing this experiment on the on the back end? Is yeah. this leading somewhere? Yeah. Not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. I've always had. Kind of what I thought was translational research projects, mm. and you write in every paper this is translational, and that was also starting to bother me as well. I never was able to figure that out. So the only way okay. to figure that out is go and translate it, break through yourself through a biotech company, make the yeah. medicine. You know, you know the definition of translation or translational changes as you go, but to actually go about and do it, that was a burning kind of desire of mine, rather than kind of hypothesizing and just leave yeah. this open question of this could be translational because we've done this set of experiments, you know, that, that, that become not enough for me, especially when I saw, you know, almost this mind blowing kind of uh, discovery right before my eyes, yes. you know, that, that was kind of uh, where, where we were. So, um, you know, that, that's how I felt there. And it yeah. was great training in many ways, but at the, at the outset, the training we had in Ireland was, you know, at a kind of academic level, theoretical level, just knowledge level, neuroanatomy, Whatever it is, that part was was at the at the standard of any yeah. any any yeah. I came across in in Harvard Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. Yeah, and it sounds yeah. like um, that that sort of resourcefulness that you learned and yes. the the working in that resource constrained environment actually gives you really good habits to then take into a biotech company, right? Because exactly. Again, everything costs so much, and there's only so much you can do. You've got to do the right experiments, not just every experiment. Yeah, the discipline and the focus. Yeah, and the yeah. you know that, that 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 that's essential. You know, and uh, you know the opportunity cost of thinking you want to do something else. You know, all that it really is. Uh, you know, it was by necessity before. Now it's by strategy and and um, resourcefulness and wanting to move quickly on one kind of defined goal, which for our company is test the first in class medicine right. in the clinical trial. Uh, at the at the earliest possible, um, what would a drug that's at a high high quality, right? A drug that you know um, is going to make it to market, you know, just that that everybody, whoever would look at it, large pharma, whoever would would be um, interested in it, they would stand behind it and say, yeah, this this is you know best in class, not just first yeah. in class. Yeah, absolutely. And so you know, thinking about people who might be listening to this, who perhaps are in a postdoc environment, have discovered something that they think has real potential, are thinking about yep. taking that step out into spinning out a company. What have been over the last few years, what have been the things that you've learned that you'd you'd share with them that you think have been the most important lessons in terms of going into that biotech environment? Um yeah, well, I think I benefited a lot by where I'm located, which is in okay. Boston. I've got, you know, this is a fantastic ecosystem around me where you can get started very quickly if you've got the right intellectual property idea. Mm -hmm. And, and um, there's a lot of kind of bridging programs to become even educated in what building a biotech is all about. For example, yeah. when I was a research fellow, I, I was able to do the Harvard Innovation Labs Venture Program, President's Innovation Challenge. They're teaching you everything along the way. You've got these word leading advisors 
volunteering their time and guiding you even at that early step. And they're building your confidence. They're they're telling you right. that you've got something of value here, that you've got something ready to, you know, to go and build a company around. So you don't just, you know, take a stab in the dark and hold, you know, uh, wish for the best. You have a lot of different people who've done this many times who are validating. What you're, and they're also telling you what not to do. You know, we, right. as I said, when yes. we started out, yes. we had a platform technology, this, these uh, unbiased in vivo phenotypic screens that were very productive for us. We could have done that for different disorders and mm. as well. And we had a couple of different therapeutic targets we were really interested in. AC2 was, was one of them, but we had others. And um, with that type of, you know, going out and, and getting battle testing your ideas, right? Go out and, and, you know, you have to tell people what you're doing. Obviously not everything that you preserve your key IP. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go and talk to uh, KOLs, VCs, different, uh, you know, people in the industry so they can they can challenge you and, and mm -hmm. then you know either what you need to work on to get to the right level or you know what not to do or what's not ready so that's just you know it's kind of i've been like that from day one kind of just putting myself out there yeah kind of almost yeah. taking these calculated risks but being willing to fail and learn from those mistakes as you go and iterate quickly and not be mm -hmm. disheartened just just be happy that you're one step closer to the right answer because you started yeah Absolutely. And I suppose having that clarity and sense of direction is really key, right? So you can only be one yeah. step closer if you know which direction you're supposed to be stepping in, I suppose. Exactly. And that, you know, that, that as I said, if you need to kind of understand the state of the art and find yeah. where there's actually meaningful kind of gap or meaningful improvement, you know, a significant kind of step, because it has to be worth the effort. Like building a biotech is not easy, very difficult, yeah. you know, you know, you have to spend, you know, almost every waking hour thinking about it, wanting to move forward. Um, and that, that, so to do that, you need to be sure you've got the right, you know, purpose. You need to be in the right place. For me, Boston IP ecosystem is is perfect place to build a biotech. Yeah. And um, the people that you, you want to build the company together with, ideally, that's a group of people who share the same purpose, who you can kind of synergize with, you know that you're helping each other so different kind of expertise viewpoints kind of challenging each other to bring out the best result because you know if you, if i went down the having my own lab um even in ireland i had the opportunity to do that but even continued through even the us system you would be you know you're a pi in your own lab you're kind of almost in a little silo right and you want to kind of carve out an area for yourself and kind of dig into your own you know best kind of whatever you think is best but when you've got a group of um, other, you know, high performing individuals with different backgrounds and expertise, and you're challenging each other all the time in a healthy way to, to just get the best answer, you know, not what mm -hmm. Shane thinks is best, you know, and we're always doing that. We're always willing to, to look at, you know, what we have or whatever plan we're planning going forward and challenge it again, even if it's painful, you know, that, that process of iteration or what we, we call in industry, the pivoting ability yes. That's what's key for biotech. You know, we, we make data-driven decisions all the time based on um, what we what we learn or what kind of happening in the environment around us. So that's essential quality for success. And just, you know, as I said, having the purpose and the people around you, that kind of helps you to persist because the persistence is key because uh, it's not going to be easy because with anything in science, you are always testing new uh, yeah. directions yeah. and you have to learn from that and you know and then move forward so that persistence is important and uh, with you know as i said the focus on the resourcefulness and and all that so um, and while while all that is happening building a you know a great team that buy into the vision and then constantly uh, looking for you know funding from vcs or in our case we also have about eight million dollars in grants so we're yeah. always applying for grants to try to you know, we, we've managed to raise about 34 million in VC and angel backed dilutive capital, but the grants have been really important because they generate momentum, they validate your science for everyone else. And when they see NIH and other people have bought in yes. different foundations, we're building relationships with foundations around who are getting excited about the technology and they're involved in it early. And that extends your runway and it's, you know, it's great. Um, you know, I'd it, that was something that there's some people they might not like academia anymore because they hate applying for grants, but 
it, I haven't got to that point yet, and I was able to bring that, um, you know, almost, you know, it's, it's a difficult process, but it's still enjoyable. Yeah. It helps you focus your thought as well. You got to articulate, you know, a plan for a year or two, and you have to be ready for again putting the idea out there. Let other people criticize it, and whatever comes back, you can improve. Um, yes. Rather than keeping it all to yourself or waiting until something is perfect, in inverted commas, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. it sounds like absolutely. all the way along, all you've way. been really keen to, as you've said, expose your ideas to the world and see where the weak points are, see where the stress test them, as you say. Yeah, and even even at the risk of you know um, you know embarrassing myself, you know right. that that uh, willing to you know uh, you know obviously uh, you want to have that confidence, that base level, you know, do your homework before you go out. But at some point, there's a, a point at which you know like the the like 80 20 percent you know principle where you're 80 percent of the way there, and that last 20 percent actually might come from you taking your 80 yeah. percent plan and going and asking people about it. Just yeah. like let them, you know, like give you feedback, and criticize, whatever they want to do with it. And you don't have to, every time someone says something doesn't mean you have to tear up what you did and start yeah. from scratch. You can listen to the consensus and 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 start to, you know, fine tune it. And that that's kind of been really helpful all the way through as well. Yeah. yeah. Or, or it might or even be, I suppose, just one thing one person thing says that unlocks the... the... Exactly. The, the a new angle, a new perspective that you yeah. know, um, you know, we what we we've always tried to do, and this was something that surprised me about the biotech, being in the biotech, the ability to collaborate. So, right. you know, people in academia, there's an idea that collaboration is strong, but then sometimes there's competition, and obviously with private companies, there's competitors in terms of other companies. But for for me to collaborate with, um, you know, world leading veterans in the biopharma industry who are now consultants or any academic lab in the world, the ability to collaborate with them has never been greater because mm. they, they're excited to work on a new medicine and about to go to the clinic. And we're able to bring in these different labs. Sometimes some of these labs might have not seen eye to eye even, KC2 world leading yeah. labs, and they both work with us. And now they're helping and they're almost, you know, cross validating each other. You know, they, right, they, yeah. are both, they are both right kind of thing and uh, helping us to, to go to the next level of, um, you know, getting over uh, whatever hurdles there was in, in drug development for this target, the new target, you know, we need customized assays. It's not easy. There's nothing off the shelf about uh, doing research on KSC2. And so that's been very, very rewarding. And, and mm -hmm. you, know, you get a crash course in all these different areas, right? I'm a neuroscientist by training, spent a lot of time, obviously, preclinical neuroscience research. But now you need to learn about everything all the way right. up to the clinic. In terms, including make, how to make a drug or discover a drug and and things like that. So what's been brilliant about and it's almost like when I was in the when I did a PhD and I was starting to teach specialization combined with generalization. Yes. In terms yes. of knowledge, you know, you're you're broadening your horizons in one area, but yes. you're also specializing in one really important thing that's differentiating you from everybody else. You kind of have both things going on. In parallel, and they almost they almost help each other because it's Absolutely. like you take a break from your specialty and you open your mind to other things, and you go back and you you kind of get a, be a better way of, of progressing your specialty, let's say. And what I loved about and what I'm still loving today in biotech is learning all these different functions. You know, as I mentioned, regulatory, yeah. clinical, commercialization, drug development. Not that I would, um, you know, you we're relying on experts in these given domains sure, to, yeah, to yeah, oversee yeah. To get the given function, but you have to be able to communicate with these people, learn their language, understand the basic background of the different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And that's almost like, you know, if I was to do courses and all of these things, it might take a very long time, but by almost um, running a, a drug development program into the clinic, you, you learn it all as you yes. go yes. and you kind of, you know, you, with with the experts kind of guide, guiding you all the way through and it works both ways you kind of want to get the best out of them and um, by kind of pushing them to think a little bit more deeply about whatever guidance or advice they they give you just um you know even if you ask me now Shane, something i'll give you the first idea of my head it might be quite good it might be nearly there yeah but if you stick with it we keep talking about it i'll give you a better answer if you Absolutely. kind of just push me a little bit more in a kind of a healthy kind of pushing kind of way and we we like to do that in every part of our organization as well, even if it's someone working a day or two a week as a consultant uh, mm -hmm. somewhere. And uh, that's been really 
productive to drive excellence, I think, in, in the different areas. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, you know, in any business, one of the best things you can do is go, okay, it's good. But is it the best we can do? Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like, you know, you, you could spend forever trying to get something just marginally better. Yeah. But at, at every point, there's always a, you know, a, a, a point where you can improve the quality in some way. Yes. And just be willing to, you know, go through the extra effort of pushing it just a little bit further and then knowing when, okay. This is the best we have, given the the timeline and what what the next step will be. Um, so I think th th there's a balance there, but yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good not just take the let's say at the very minimum, don't take the first idea of everybody's head <laughs> for every different uh, step of your journey. No absolutely. no, absolutely. And I I want to touch on this. I don't want to spend too long on it because it could be a very long conversation. But um, yeah. I think the point you make about grants is really important. Um, yeah. Because eight million dollars isn't going to get you there, but it's not yeah. an insignificant amount of money. And exactly. it's I think grant funding is really neglected by a lot of biotech companies. Yeah. Um, but that's been a, a sort of deliberate part of your strategy, it sounds like. Exactly. It felt, it felt like, you know, we have that routine or habit of from academia anyway, not missing any important calls. Right. How would you miss this? So it, it made sense. We are doing this research anyway. We, yeah. we know what we want to do. It's exciting. Clearly, it's breakthrough. Research is, you know, in the, recently published in the best papers is about to translate huge potential. So why wouldn't this be a great grant? Of course it is. So um, as you go, you write these uh, different grants. And for the other purpose we use them for is something that's not uh, one of the programs that maybe isn't, you know, we're using our capital for. Mm -hmm. We can call it a side project, something like that. And we know it's interesting. We know it's important. But we're not going to dedicate capital right now because we're very right. focused on, on the one on the one goal. But why not have a you know this other parallel track of research where we're collaborating with an additional world leading lab, and they're doing you know not that we're bringing all this work in house, but we're collaborating on this important area that only they can do really well. They're excited about it, and we'll write a grant together and we'll collaborate, and we'll have this data for maybe an you know a secondary indication, a secondary asset whatever that might be. So it's been a very way, a good, a great way of like expanding our, yeah. our kind of uh, license as well. And as I said, I think it validates our work. So when people are doing due diligence, they see uh, these different, uh, you know, grant bodies, DOD, NH, yeah. whatever it is, um, are bought into what we're doing. And it kind of de-risks it for them in that, from that perspective. A hundred percent. And it's not just about the money, it's about the mentality, but it's also about the the fact that not only are you getting non-dilutive funding, but you're also making the core of your business more investable yes. for those who want to exactly. bring in equity funding, right? Yeah, there's a there's of course a balance to it. You know, yeah. grant cycles can be you know protracted, and you know you're, you're waiting, so you don't want to be waiting, you don't want to be holding up the whole show, waiting on the outcome of a grant. But there's a there's a there's a way to do it that it yeah. would never yeah. slow you down, but would only always kind of be added to to your, yes. your overall goals. Yeah, absolutely. So coming back to today and coming back to Axonis and, and the work you're doing. So it's it looks like a really exciting time getting closer and closer to the clinic. Um, yes. Tell us a bit about, you know, what's next, what lies ahead? So um, at the end of the year, we'll start clinical trials. Um, yeah. So we're very excited about that. You know, it's healthy volunteers just proving it's safe and tolerable. Like we were very confident about from any any of the work we've done today preclinically, and mm -hmm. then that sets us up to run uh, trials later in epilepsy and pain, which um, again we've done a lot of research to support um, those those trials, um, and you know so that that's kind of the the the, the plans for our lead molecule, um, as first in class oral drug for case C two, and we're also at the moment fundraising, and um, so that's going to support. These phase two trials yeah. um, next year and beyond. Um, and that's, uh, you know, and we're always, you could say people are always fundraising. It's just definitely true. Yes. Um, but yeah. now it's very targeted. Um, we're ready for, to, you know, push ourselves into being a clinical stage company. And it's a great time to, to get that support and buy in from other uh, investors. And, you know, when you find the right investor, they become top partners. You know, they're very experienced yeah. in these areas yeah. and they really help. And drive the company forward and that's been you know our executive chairman Corey Goodman has been like that from day one 
uh, with that experience and that also background in neuroscience and that passion for what we're doing, it's been, you know, the, the, a big um, benefit for us. And we want more mm-hmm. people like that to come in and help us in this in the next steps in terms of getting this medicine to the patients that need it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's incredibly exciting. We have our fingers crossed for you. Um, Appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time, Shane. Absolute pleasure. And uh, I'd say we could talk for hours, uh, the two of us, but yes. uh, it's great to <laughs> connect today. And um, I appreciate your interest in, in highlighting in what Exonus are doing and um, giving me the chance to share some of my learnings over the last you know, 15 years of being a neuroscientist and uh, hope somebody can maybe benefit from any, any, of, the, any of the thoughts I shared and um, can get inspired to want to make medicines themselves. And, and if anyone is interested in learning more, I'm very um, happy to catch up with anybody. Um, I'm sure my profile might be linked somewhere. Yeah. Happy to, to yeah. meet anybody. And if they're thinking about, you know, they have passion projects in research and they really want to figure out whether they can translate it as a medicine. No, well, it's, it's a really kind offer, Shane, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.